Good morning and welcome to everybody watching across various platforms this morning. I'm Jason Marzak, Director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council. To start off, as of today, Latin America and the Caribbean remains the most affected region in the world by COVID-19. Home to over 8.8 .8 million infections and 11 of the 15 countries with the world's highest death rates. This is as reported in the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center's Avisa LATAM COVID-19 last week, which is delivered every Thursday uh, to inboxes. As the global death toll has also passed 1 million, two of the five countries with the most deaths in the world are in our region. The virus has deeply affected every aspect of life across Latin America and the Caribbean with severe strains placed on regional economies, including, of course, those economies in Central America. But as countries look to reactivate their economies, is it possible, is it possible to also use this moment as one to leapfrog long-standing barriers to economic growth? As global supply chains are reconfigured in the face of the pandemic, how can Central America take advantage of nearshoring opportunities? In essence, and it may often feel like a stretch to think this way these days, but are there opportunities that can be created out of the COVID-19 crisis? Yes, in Central America, the dual shock of a public health crisis and economic crisis is compounded in a region that has long grappled with weak rule of law, governance challenges, and lack of economic opportunities. But that this unprecedented moment in history can also be a wake-up call for national and regional action in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Panama, to seize existing opportunities and also find new ones to generate economic reactivation amid mounting health challenges. This is really critical to bolster sustained economic growth and prosperity, and it should also unite individuals and leaders across the region to develop strategies for growth, diversification, and integration. The opportunities could perhaps be boundless, but also the consequences of inaction will likely, likewise also be felt for years to come. We will focus on the opportunities that could come out of, the, out of COVID in Central America during today's discussion, as well as look at the longstanding barriers that must be uh, moved move past to look at those opportunities. Today's conversation also marks the launch of an Adrian Arsh Latin America Center report by former President Laura Chinchilla, a member of the Advisory Council of the Center, former Minister of El Salvador, Maria Eugenia Brizuela de Avila, who is also a non-resident fellow of the Center, and in the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center, Maria Fernanda Bozmoski and Domingo Sarduni. This report examines specific opportunities for Central American economic recovery at a time of increasing global uncertainty. It provides a positive outlook for a region with vast untapped potential, especially if it can seize opportunities through its demographic bonus, through near sharing of global supply chains, and a renewed push toward economic integration. I'd like to thank uh, former President Tinchia, former Minister Bruce Weller for joining us today, as well as our other speakers, uh, Salvador Paisa of Funsepa, Enrique Bolaños of Incai Business School, and Andy Herskowitz, who's the Chief Development Officer of the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation, and is joining us in place of Adam Bowler, who had to cancel due to an urgent matter. Maria Fernanda Bosnowski will moderate the conversation following President Tinchia's remarks. I'm also excited that being able to do this over Zoom means that we are able to bring in the perspectives of five different countries uh, in this one call. And thank you to our, our speakers for joining us uh, live today from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and of course, the United States. To kick up the conversation, I'd like to now introduce former President Laura Chinchilla, who will provide keynote remarks. President Chinchilla served as president of the Republic of Costa Rica from 2010 to 2014. After serving in various other public service roles, including Vice President of Costa Rica, Minister of Public Security, President of the National Immigration Board, and the National Drug Council. She's also, as I mentioned, a member of the Advisory Council of the Center. And I'll also add to your bio, President Chinchilla, one of the foremost uh, experts uh, in Central America and one of the most noted authorities in the region about development matters overall. Before we begin with President Chinchilla, I'd like to turn it over to businesswoman and philanthropist, uh, and I'll also say visionary, uh, Adrian Arst, who is the Atlantic Council's Executive Vice Chair, and also, of course, founder of the Adrian Arst Latin America Center and the Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Adrian? 
Thank you, Jason, and good morning to all of you in different time zones, um, especially thank you for those who've started even earlier. President Chinchia or offline Laura, I particularly appreciate all you have done to work with us and now being on our advisory council at the center um, so that you can provide us with a point of view that is both on the ground where you are now, but from your years of experience to bring us a broader point of view. And also thank you to everybody who's on the panel. Um, I am soon going to go mute and turn off my screen, but what you are going to tell us today will move us forward as we think about the region and the importance of those countries and that area of the world that before this received insignificant attention. Now I'll turn it back to you, Jason, to kick things off. Great, thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, again, very excited to be having this conversation today, focusing on a region that's so near and dear to so many of us, Central America, but as Adrian says, one that, a, a region that doesn't receive the attention that it, that it so deserves. So very happy to have this conversation. And now everyone please join me in welcoming Laura Chinchilla. President Chinchilla. Uh, well, good morning uh, to all of those who are connected. Uh, thank you so much, Jason. And thanks to uh, Adrienne and the Adrienne Arch Latin American Center for supporting this initiative on Central America. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge the persons who contributed uh, with the elaboration of the paper that is serving as the basis for this discussion, Maria Eugenia, Enrique, Salvador, Maria Fernanda, and Domingo. Many thanks to all. Our intention is to provide some ideas on how to sustain reactivation of the Central American economies in a COVID-19 world. The IMF estimates that Central American countries will experience an economic downturn close to minus 5%, a less dramatic rate than the foreseen average for Latin America, close to minus 10%. However, this subregion is the most exposed to the negative long-lasting effects of the crisis, considering the pre-existing vulnerabilities that have hindered inclusive growth to already too long, for already too long. Let me recall the most uh, chronic problems that the region was suffering before the pandemic hit us. Uh, number one, economic slowdown, along with historical low productivity rates and high levels of informality among the five countries with the highest levels of informality in Latin America, four are in Central America. In those countries, uh, between 70 and 85% of the workforce is informal. Number two, low coverage of inequality of education, uh, low coverage and, and, and quality of education and ill-equipped workers. According to a report on the state of education in the region, 5.4 5 million young people between the ages of 15 and 24, that accounts for 60% of the total, were outside the educational system. Number three, high poverty rates. While the average poverty rate in Latin America is around 30%, in Central America is close to 38%. Four out of the six countries with higher poverty rates in Latin America are also from Central America. It is estimated that the crisis will leave 2.5 million more people in poverty. Number four, high levels of violence also. The homicide rates have been slowing down in Central America during the last 10 years. Uh, they are still the highest in the world. Beyond the painful loss of human lives, uh, it is estimated that the costs associated to crime and violence amount to almost 8% of Central America's GDP. Number five, migration flows. Uh, the previous circumstances largely explain the waves of immigration to the United States. The tensions of Central Americans in the U.S. border have increased steadily uh, in the last 10 years. 
they also explain the consolidation of a vicious cycle in which the young workforce leaves their countries only to become a main source of income in their countries of origin through remittances. Last year, for example, remittances surpassed 20% of GDP in some of our nations. And number six, badly funded and dysfunctional states and disenchantment with democracy. Uh, for example, in 2018, the average tax revenue as percentage of GDP in Central America was 40%. Uh, no country is able to provide high quality public services with such meager incomes. In addition, some of these states lack the necessary standards to ensure efficiency, integrity, and the rule of law. All of this has resulted in a growing and dangerous disenchantment with democracy. The support for democracy in three of the Central American nations between 2010 and 2017 felt dramatically between 30 to 40 points. So as we can see, by the end of 2019, the Central American region was facing a volatile combination of challenges that were already posing serious threats for our stability and security. We were living in the most explosive context I can remember since the years of the civil wars. The pandemic crisis came to put um, more fuel to this situation. So it is very urgent to think in strategies to prompt actions and mobilize resources to reactivate the economies of these countries and to guarantee the protection of the most vulnerable. The measures of economic reactivation must meet at least the following three conditions. First, to be designed with a medium and long-term perspective in a way that policies can tackle the aforementioned structural change challenges, setting the basis of high dynamic, inclusive, and sustainable development. Uh, second, to be built on our strengths and taking advantage of the opportunities provided by this new reality. And finally, to put the people at the center of their concerns, and especially the youth of our countries. In this paper that we are presenting today, we identified three key areas of opportunity. Uh, the first is the transformations in global value chains and the geographical relocation of production processes. The second is a renewed push for regional economic integration. And the last one, but probably the most important, is uh, a demographic bonus of a large working age population. Let me very briefly introduce them. It is known that a significant amount of US firms are planning to move their supply chains uh, among Asian countries or away uh, from Asia entirely. As the, American becomes, um, um, as the Americas becomes an increasingly attractive alternative, Central America has an opportunity to position itself as a region of choice for some nearshoring and foreign investment platforms that can ramp up job creation in the formal sector, while offering companies supply chains uh, resilience at a competitive cost. Beyond its geographical position, the most selling value proposition for Central America is its unique economic ties to the two of the world's largest markets, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica, along with the Dominican Republic, are among the, among the few countries in the world that are parties to regional trade agreements with both the United States and the European Union. Historically, Central America has shown a greater trade openness than the rest of Latin America. According to ECLAC, in 2018, the gap between the trade openness indies between both Central America and the rest of the region was approximately 30% of the respective GDP. So that is good news. 
Uh, now, the transformations in global value chains and the geographical relocation of production processes should be complemented by more productive and competitive domestic markets and by promoting a renewed push for regional economic integration that expand market access and take advantage of economies of scale, which is our second recommendation. A better integrated Central America can more efficiently allocate economic resources and investment, access new intra-regional markets, uh, boost foreign trade, improve commercial agreements, and enter new ones with increased bargaining power. Uh, we also should set a priority regional agenda for alignment and coordination on a specific integration issues. We also emphasize on the need of fostering fair, efficient, and transparent institutions that guarantee adherence to the rule of law and achieve legal certainty. And finally, uh, let me give you some words about the demographic bonus of a large working age population. As I already mentioned, we need to take immediate action with the future in mind. That means prioritizing the safety and education of the region's youth. Central America can change if, it, if its youngest generations escape informality and violence and successfully participate in the formal economy. Yet, we have a relatively narrow window to achieve that four of the six countries in the region will experience an increase in their working age population over the next two to four decades. Some studies have suggested that either national governments dedicate themselves to seriously improve the human capital of the population, economic growth per capita will be 30% higher compared to the baseline. In doing so, we should develop a strategy to bring education and training to those about entering the job market and to intervene with job creation programs in the towns with higher percentages of emigration to the United States. I firmly uh, believe that there exist enough reasons to put together a task force with the participation of governments, the private sector, the civil society, and the international financial and development institutions to consolidate current and new initiatives in one single plan for Central America aimed at reactivating our economies while tackling some of our most pressing structural challenges. Central American nations find themselves amidst the commemoration of the bicentennial of their independence. This time of crisis could turn out to be a time of great opportunity to honor the dreams and stability and prosperity of past and present generations of Central Americans. Thank you. Thank you, President Chinchilla, for those reflections from our shared hometown of San Jose, Costa Rica. Thank you also for so nicely packaging the contents of the report and our findings. Um, although I am currently in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I am ecstatic about hosting this next part of today's event. Proudly a predominantly Central American panel. In San Salvador, El Salvador, Maria Eugenia Orizuela de Avila, currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Adrian Arch Latin America Center and the first ever female minister of foreign affairs for El Salvador joins us along with uh, Enrique Bolaños, president of Incae Business School, the best business school in Latin America, currently in Managua, Nicaragua. Salvador Pais, uh, president of Fundacion Sergio Pais Andrade from CEPA and co-chair of Grupo PDC is also joining us uh, from Guatemala City. And last but not least, Andy Hersowitz, uh, Chief Development Officer from the U.S. Uh, International Development Finance Corporation is joining us from Washington, D.C. 
Uh, friends, I do hope that the next time that we're doing this, it will be in person and in Central America. But for now, I guess Zoom will have to do. For the next half hour or so, we will focus on how Central America can position itself to unlock opportunities for sustainable economic growth in a COVID-19 world. We'll exchange ideas and reflections on the opportunities examined in the report and build on President Chinchilla's words earlier. We'll talk about Central America's demographic bonus, the nearshoring trends, and how to further advance regional economic integration. But we will also dive into the internal challenges that remain. Rule of law, governance, and corruption. Externally, lack of consistency in US funding and as Adrian was mentioning, interest from the international community in the region and for the region has added to the challenges that citizens face day to day. Mayu, I hope that the weather is nice in San Salvador. And let's, let's kick it off with you. My first question is, um, the pandemic, as President Chichi was saying, has pushed companies to consider relocating their supply chains closer to the US market and hedge against global disruptions. Central America can become a preferred region for nearshoring. But my, uh, how can Central American governments and the private sector work together to seize these opportunities, especially given the challenges in fostering business friendly environments? Hello to everyone. And thank you, Maria Fernanda and the Atlantic Council for inviting me today. I am honored to be part of this working group who have their hearts in our region. And you are right, the US-China trade war has forced China-based supply chain companies to consider those risks of tariffs and other effects to move on. And in 2020, when the pandemic further accelerated this momentum, you can see them then moving on, these companies looking and potentially moving closer to the US market. According to our recent report, you can see perfectly well Mexico becoming a top destination in Latin America. But why? It's because of the predictability. It's because of the investment security that the newly ratified US-Mexico-Canada agreement gives them. And that is why I am so sure that Central America has the same opportunity. Because I remember as foreign minister, I had the honor of initiating both the negotiations for Kafka DR and also for the association agreement with the European Union. And as you can see, President Trump has not tweeted anything against our own Kafka results because they are favorable to the United States. So the most prominent value proposition as President Chinchia stated out for Central America of hoping to become this new hub for global supply chains is this unique economic tie that we have, as we have seen from these treaties. We had in the year 2010, $59 billion in the two-way trade and 14 billion respectively. So these trade agreements have helped promote the economic growth and we need them to generate the new jobs in Central America. They have also sparked, as we have seen mostly with the European Union, the opportunity for those allies to promote cooperation, democratic values, and the rule of law. But we also need the private sector, because it is the private sector who can support governments in promoting this effort. The private sector testifies to the provisions on labor, on customs, on the rules of origin, there are those that give the security and stability to the companies to which they are seeking. Specifically, we see textiles, agriculture, electronics, which are major experts under these agreements. And they have an enormous opportunity to increase the volume of these goods in these sectors. One special area which I see flourishing is call centers. My participation in TELUS International, leading its Community Investment Committee, allows me personally to testify to the thousands of young Salvadorans and Central Americans who are trained through their first job being a call center 
taking advantage of young bilingual speakers. But definitely, we need also to face the challenges that President Ching Chi already exposed. We need to strengthen the rule of law and governance. One big important obstacle is overcoming political polarization. This disenchantment with democracy, we have to be even stronger in magnifying the benefits of the respect for human rights and also for democracy so, with a continued fight against corruption. So investors need these securities and our countries need investment to generate the jobs and growth to meet our people's needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mayu. I want to go uh, over to you, Andy, and pick up on Mayu's last point about investment. Um, Andy, the Central America Bank for Economic Integration foresees a worst case scenario where Central America's GDP contracts by up to 5% uh, in 2020. What investments is the DFC considering that would help countries reactivate their economies from the pandemic induced downturn? Great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for inviting the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, DFC, which is the U.S. government's newest agency created with the purpose of really trying to use investment to drive development. Um, we've got tremendous experience uh, investing in Central America and all throughout Latin America. In fact, it's our largest portfolio. We inherited the portfolio from the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, in addition to being the Chief Development Officer, I also co-chair the COVID Task Force for DFC. And we learned a couple of things early on. Our immediate response was focused on uh, not just looking for opportunities to support the production of, of PPE and other protective equipment and other things related to the health response. We also realized, based on our years of learnings and responding to things like earthquakes and hurricanes in Central America, that one of the greatest things that you can do is close the liquidity gap that you see. And what I mean by that is often you'll see a lot of the large banks um, sitting on excess capital and liquidity because a lot of their clients are in fact the, the tourist companies, um, large infrastructure companies, companies that have insurance. And so the larger banks will wait and see what's happening, whether they're gonna get paid or not. And they'll sit on this excess capital. There's a lot of capital on the sidelines. We're seeing that in the United States right now. But then where you see a run on the capital is really at the, with, the, with the smaller banks, the microfinance institutions, the ones that cater to individuals and small businesses, people who are ready to rebuild right away, who want to access their savings so they can start their small business, whether it's construction for rebuilding, or even someone who's going to be making food to sell to the people who are in the construction business rebuilding. So we really work hard to close that liquidity gap. One of the first things that DFC started to do was to look for opportunities to get capital to these smaller financial institutions, to small and medium enterprises. Um, we've also made strong commitments already to both Guatemala and Honduras of investing up to a billion dollars. But the fastest way to recover really is through getting capital into the economy. I'm not so worried about Central America and a contraction because uh, the countries of Central America are extremely resilient. I, I've lived in Nicaragua. Um, I've lived there. I, I've experienced natural disasters. I've experienced earthquakes. I've experienced flooding, hurricanes, all of these things. And I see how resilient the people at the village level are in figuring out how to take capital that comes in and rebuild very quickly and how to rebuild smarter. And so our view is the faster we can get money into the hands of people, the faster that that people can rebuild. Now, that being said, it's not just about getting money into people for small businesses. We also have to make sure that industry really can uh, compete on a global level. I was living in Dominican Republic when DR CAFTA, I was working for the US government at the time when DR CAFTA was being negotiated and passed. And I saw the impacts that a simple trade agreement can have in either helping or destroying an entire industry. I saw how in the textile industry, some countries, because of DR CAFTA, were impacted positively, others were impacted negatively, because the amount of money, this a small amount of difference in certain incentives can make or break an industry. Our hope, though, is that, um, and I've always had this view, is the US, the Americas, all the resources that we need 
are located in this hemisphere. And this is the reason that regional collaboration is so critical, not just between the US and individual countries in Central America, but at a regional level. Um, I did note that the paper talks a bit about regional integration and the benefits of that. My view, having spent 12 years living in Latin America, is that one of the greatest indicators of a country's um, advancement from an economic development standpoint is how well regionally integrated it is. And what I mean is that, that products and name brands are existing across borders. When you see Pollo Campero located in Peru or in another country, you know that there's greater regional integration in the countries. What it tells you when there's regional integration is that the customs laws are working. It tells you that, that the trade laws are working, that the tariffs are in the right place. And it helps countries depend not just on a relationship with a large economy like the US or China or a European country, but depend on one another and growing together so that you can achieve economies of scale at production. DFC is getting ready to launch its first ever development strategy, which our team has been working on for several months. And we're looking at everything under a COVID lens. But what that really means is that we're looking at how can we get countries to develop agriculture, but not just growing items, but also agro processing. How can we get countries that are growing tomatoes to actually can those tomatoes and be part of the global supply chain? So there's a heavy emphasis on not just growing, but also processing, manufacturing, and trading. To that end, we're also having a heavy focus on technology. How can we use technology to help countries uh, move at a faster rate than they have in the past? Uh, I remember when I was living in Nicaragua, I was working on a, in a small town that had one telephone. And it was one telephone that a guy named Max ran, and one day the phone was down. And we were running a construction project. And we had 30 people showing up at the construction project every single day for three days, waiting for supplies to arrive from Managua. But what we realize now is other places, if you had a mobile phone, one phone call could have told everybody that those supplies weren't going to arrive and they could have gone on and become more productive. Simple things like technology, information sharing, connectivity, help countries move much, much more quickly than the United States and other economies had to develop. But the lack of having that type of infrastructure and having that type of connectivity can really can really uh, prevent people and keep them behind. Thanks, Andy. And I'm, I, I want to particularly emphasize what you were saying about regional economic integration, because exactly as you mentioned, it is one of the points that we drilled down on in the report. Um, and while the individual countries and economies in Central America don't make a dent in the global economy together they amount to an economy of scale so salvador this next question is for you um regional economic integration has been an ongoing project in central america since the 50s um, with a combined population of over 45 million people producing around uh, 400 billion dollars in gdp an integrated Central America, truly integrated Central America, could bring vast benefits. Uh, could include market expansion for, for local firms, could boost uh, FDI, trade. So my question to you is, it just seems so obvious. Why, why is it that economic integration in Central America has been so hard to achieve? And do you think that the pandemic and the moment we're currently in could bring new momentum to this project and this idea? Thank you, Maria Fernanda, and thank you for the Atlantic Council's invitation to participate on this uh, paper and in this panel. It's an honor to be with uh, panelists like Mayu, Enrique, and Andy. Uh, I would say that uh, regional integration has been occurring on the private sector side. And I would also say, despite Central American governments and uh, their lack of leadership and vision on this particular topic, uh, integration is not an end in and of itself. It is a means whereby we can become more competitive as a region and generate more jobs. Uh, the benefits will accrue in the medium term, but most politicians have been unwilling to make the short-term sacrifices uh, during their mandate. Uh, sure, there's certain things that have happened since the 1950s in terms of unified customs codes, 
the CA4 uh, institutions like uh, uh, CISE and CIECA, and in some cases, some integrated customs like the Guatemala Honduras Customs Union. But if we look at the overall 70 year window, progress has been incredibly slow. So I would say, uh, um, how do we use the uh, pandemic as an opportunity uh, was the challenge uh, that was presented. Um, I would say that it, we must start by recognizing that inwardly focused governments uh, have become even more so throughout this pandemic. And we need deliberate and decisive actions that can generate the momentum uh, behind integration. And, and some of the things I'm talking about include, uh, for example, agreeing on and reaching for low hanging fruit and communicating the benefit of achieving those low hanging fruit results uh, to all. For example, uh, digitalizing customs offices and integrating them into a com common systems platform like the US-Mexico Fast Card program would allow known shippers to send their cargo documents ahead of time and speed through borders. That would be an incredible boost uh, towards uh, regionalization, towards integration, and more importantly, towards uh, job creation and recovery. I think we need to agree on very concrete deliverables and hold ourselves accountable, uh, for example, around energy integration or the creation of a Central American Customs Union. And I do think that we need to elevate the role uh, of local governments, of private sector collaboration with those local governments. I would also say we need to raise the volume of the encouragement, uh, I'll call it that way, by the US and other international institutions, and that we need to shift the leadership um, uh, from uh, SICA and SIECA and really uh, enable those organizations to be um, uh, tools to speed up the process, not necessarily uh, the leaders of the process. Thank you, Salvador. At this moment, I want to take a, a pause and encourage all of you across our different platforms to submit your questions. Uh, our panelists will, will respond to them at the end. Um, so please send us your questions if you're on Zoom through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, or if you're on Twitter or Facebook, use the hashtag AC Central America. Enrique, I have not forgotten about you and I want to go to you next. As the youngest subregion in, in Latin America, uh, Central America's dependency peak, as President Chinchilla was saying, is at least a decade away, in some cases, four decades away. Um, what cross-sectorial steps and policies can be taken uh, to actually seize this demographic opportunity and avoid ending up with an aged and burdened population as we have seen in other parts of the world? Uh, good morning, Maria Fernanda. Thank you, you and the Atlantic Council for inviting me to this panel. It's a pleasure to be here, accompanied by Laura Chinchilla, the President, Salvador, Andy, uh, Mayu, all dear friends. Uh, like President Chinchilla said, the demographic opportunity for us is really an opportunity for the region. Uh, but it's also a challenge because uh, we, don't, we haven't been able to take advantage of this opportunity. As a region, we use the demographic bonus as a means to have a safety valve and we send our youth and our young people to migrate and uh, the remittances is what we value as part of that demographic bonus. And if you look at the window that President Chinchia mentioned, we really have an opportunity to take advantage of the bonus to generate and fuel economic growth and to really give opportunities to the young population of the region to have future and to have a life in their own countries. And I basically would divide it into two broad sections. One would be we need to provide the conditions for them to fully develop their potential. This obviously includes health, includes proper nutrition, and includes education. If they don't have those basic rights and those basic opportunities, then they have to migrate and go abroad and look for those opportunities abroad. But then besides giving them the health and the nutrition and the education, we need to make changes internally. We need to make changes in the business climate. 
uh, in the investment and economic development, which might be accompanied by stronger institutions, by rule of law, by legal certainty, such that when those young people try to fulfill their aspirations, they will find the opportunities to do within the region and they will not have to migrate. We, uh, you know, the way we look at the bonus is as a safety valve. I, I really believe the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the cost for the region of losing our youth and the future talent in our countries? And perhaps some of the countries that receive our people view our people as a cost and they really are benefiting from this youth and the talent that they are receiving. If we have the demographic bonus, then we can do a lot of changes and a lot of improvements in the economic development for the countries. We will definitely need to focus on education. For example, in that task force that uh, President Chichia mentioned, well, education needs to change. We need to retrain our people. We need to go back to school for a lifetime. With the new technology, lifetime education is a must, and therefore that's an area in which we as a region need to focus. And we need to use technology to leapfrog the education of our people, and then use through technology, not through brick and mortar classrooms, to really have a massive effort in training our people. Then we can have other initiatives, like for example, we can, we can put in the laws rules that adapt automatically things like retirement age, like a fully funded system so that when our people become of retirement age, they can have a lifetime and they can have the safety and the security and not be burdened like they are right now. So it's really changing the shift, changing the focus, uh, looking for education, but creating the economic opportunities, the rule of law, and all of the changes needed so that uh, the opportunities are created within the region. Thank you, Enrique. Andy, quickly, I want to go back to you. Um, we just heard from Enrique from the, I would say, the regional perspective, but also the international community and the U.S. and specifically the DFC can play a role here um, in, in, in the investments that would help further translate opportunities for the young people. Can you, can you talk a little bit about those investments? Sure. So as I mentioned, we're getting ready to launch a development strategy and it's gonna focus uh, across six sectors. So food security and agriculture, healthcare, um, uh, it's gonna include infrastructure and technology, um, energy so not just big energy investment in access um, in 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 power generation but also access to energy for for those who don't have access as well which is critical um we've got um uh water and sanitation and then financial inclusion and i mentioned financial inclusion making sure that we really reach uh, the young people we reach small businesses we reach women through dfc's 2x initiative which has made a six billion dollar commitment to to financing projects that are going to be to the benefit of women as well. And then there's cross cutting themes there as well, including uh, making sure that we're helping uh, strengthen the financial sectors, the systems within countries as well, that we're creating jobs, again, that we're using innovation as well. What I've seen, uh, you know, I spent, I mentioned I spent the first 12 years of my career with USAID in Latin America. And then for the last seven years, I've been was running a program called Power Africa. And uh, that was, it ended up being the largest public private partnership for, for development in the world. We had 170 partners and uh, basically uh, had $56 billion of commitments. But one of the things that I saw was incredible innovation in Africa, particularly in the area of financial services. You see mobile money um, for people who never had bank accounts using mobile money in ways that we haven't even uh, done it in the United States. It's only starting to take off more and more with Venmo and things like that. So you're seeing incredible innovation. We see that young people are driving a lot of that innovation, whether it's through off-grid electricity or financial services. So a significant part of DFC's investments will be uh, hopefully in fintech, and we're looking at, at innovation across the entire sector. Thanks, Andy. Mayu, uh, when we first worked together, we, um, we put out a report back in 2017 with a set of recommendations uh, on the, uh, for the rule of law, reducing insecurity, and for generating economic opportunities. Um, 
that would translate into sustained economic growth. Building on, on what we have just heard from Andy and Enrique and Salvador, what would you say, what types of investments and public-private partnerships should be prioritized in order to make the most of this demographic bonus that the region is experiencing right now? Definitely one conclusion that we have from the Atlantic Council's reports, as you say this one in the previous one, is that recognition of the potential for economic growth that results from the changes in the age structure that we have in our countries. And the peak year for this is the year 2033. So this means that we do have a possibility of increasing productivity, which is the normal result of the democratic bonus for a few more years. So it is vital that we make the right investments or else we risk that it will evaporate as we fight the pandemic and our economies are paralyzed by health concerns. Just in my country, in El Salvador, from January to May, we lost 80,000 formal jobs. So investments should accompany, as Enrique also complementing his intervention, it touched upon health, also in education. I think also one aspect that has to be considered is the opportunity that we have to prioritize putting people to work in formal labor markets. This implies formalizing our economies. You know, 70% of our economies are informal. So new just legislation should introduce formalization mechanisms, such as the monotributo, which is a single tax scheme found in Chile, in Colombia, and in other Latin countries. And as Andy has stated, you know, the access to financial possibilities when people are formalized, this will definitely catapult the possibilities of not only the country's development, but mostly based upon an equal opportunity for all. So investments in training our youth is vital, especially if, as we are, have migrated to virtual schools. This is, effort is to guarantee digital access to all is so important. Many students nowadays are accessing public schools through smart telephones. So partnerships with communication companies is vital and investment in the grid so that more and more rural areas also have the capacity of linking and connecting to the web. But a young and robust workforce does not necessarily translate into economic growth. So if unemployed, if we don't get the investments right, working age men and women can definitely resort to criminal activities and pose a risk to the country's securities. So if we don't think and invest in a long-term strategy, focusing primarily on increasing productivity, we can end up with a population that's stalked by maras, gangs, not only in the Northern Triangle, but with more and more international presence, and also with new peaks in migration. Uh, another example, uh, before I close, Maria Fernanda, of investing in productivity, concretely in my country, is linked to the gender dividend that we have. 53% of the population is female. Consolidating remote work, introducing flexibility in the labor force, can incorporate many women who have taken the leaky pipe out as rigid working schedules have not allowed them to comply with family responsibilities. So an example again of investing in productivity with Salvadoran women contributing positively is to promote the conditions for active participation of women and other marginalized groups. Thank you. Thank you. Enrique, I want to bring Nicaragua into focus. The pandemic is straining Nicaragua's economic and political vulnerabilities. It's amplifying interna in internal tensions and challenges, institutional tensions and challenges. And a lot of the working age population continues to migrate to Costa Rica. You have years of economic stagnation. There's an erosion of democracy. What is your short to medium 
long-term outlook for Nicaragua, especially with what's happening right now with the pandemic? And how can the international community, the United States, but also the European Union, play a more assertive role in addressing the crisis that is currently happening in your country? Yes, Maria uh, Fernanda. Uh, I could say that Nicaragua is a country with a very, very sad story. This country, Nicaragua, is once again in the news due to the political crisis of the day and due to the institutional weakness. If you go back a little bit in history, after more than 40 years of the Somoza dictatorship, the Sandinista Revolution in 1979 came forward expecting to lead an improvement in the well-being of our people. What we received was a decade of autocratic rule and economic mismanagement that sent the country's GDP back 25 years. In 1990, we had a democratic election. Mrs. Chamorro took office. But by 2007, the Ortega government came back again. And these last 12, 13 years, democratic institutions, the rule of law have eroded. And Nicaragua, like Cuba and Venezuela, is now considered to be an authoritarian regime according to the Democracy Index. A Nicaraguan philosopher says that the history of Nicaragua is like a circular path, where the future is the past that returns. And that past is returning again in the middle of another political crisis. The change of the social security benefits back in April of 2018 was the spark that generated the student uprising in that time. And the government responded so severely that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights considered it a violation of crime against humanity, almost you can say that. So now, after two years of political crisis, COVID-19 impacts Nicaragua. And therefore, our short to medium term outlook for the country I can see is very grim. The magnitude of the fall in GDP in these last three years could very well be classified as, as a country going into economic depression. And the economic forecasts for the region place Nicaragua as the only country that's going to also have a negative GDP in 2021. Therefore, in order for Nicaragua to take advantage of the opportunities that we've talked about in today's panel, we need to first address the key political problem, which is a political problem, in which I believe the international community can have an assertive role. We need the definitely to work on recovering the institutions, recover, recovering the rule of law, and creating conditions to have a free and transparent elections in 2021. If the elections are perceived to be fair and free, then the new government would have the, both the local and the international legitimacy and could enter a process of institutional transformation and economic policies to attain competitiveness business climate, rule of law, use of technology, congruent with the needs of the Nicaraguan people. In summary, to conclude, Maria Fernanda, the economic problem was created initially by a political crisis and is now exacerbated by the pandemic. The outlook remains bad and the economic improvements and well-being of the people will be significantly dependent on the resolution of the political crisis. Thank you, Enrique. Given uh, the time, I now want to turn it over to our co-author, Domingo Salurni, who is currently in Miami, who will take us home with uh, questions from the audience. Domingo, over to you. Thank you, uh, Maria Fernanda, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, I'd like now to take a few questions we have received in the chat box. Uh, we have one first question from Julia Cifuentes from the Washington office of Latin America in DC. Um, how might the problem of corruption affect the region, um, the region's economic reactivation post COVID? Salvador, you wanna take this one? Uh, sure. Well, certainly I think that that is a uh, endemic problem, something that we uh, need to address. I would also say that um, it would have affected uh, our development path uh, independent uh, of COVID. So uh, Mayu already uh, touched on some of the things uh, that we could do, but uh, let me say this, in the case of Guatemala, what we've uh, started to do is we've tried to measure uh, 
uh, the criminal justice system and the effectiveness of the criminal justice system through a criminal justice flow chart. And uh, we're now better able to understand where the bottlenecks are uh, in that criminal justice system. And we're better able to target interventions. And I would uh, put on the table, one of the low hanging fruit uh, could be the digitalization of the criminal justice system as a means to really uh, improve that efficiency of our current uh, criminal justice system. So uh, that might be a uh, solution that could be uh, implemented, I would say, uh, hopefully as part of this whole conversation and discussion uh, to target corruption, to strengthen uh, rule of law, and uh, to be sure that uh, we can reactivate the economies uh, at the requisite uh, size and speed, uh, certainly uh, corruption and, and uh, the, the fight against corruption needs to be at the heart and center of it. Thank you. Thank you, Salvador. Um, we have another question from um, Juan Carlos Zapata from Guatemala's Fundesa. Uh, how do you see the future of public education in Central America? if there's no vaccine for COVID-19 in the next two years? Enrique, I think this question is right down your alley. Would you like to take this one? Sure, Domingo. Uh, I think Juan Carlos's question was referring to vaccine uh, uh, and, and uh, the impact of COVID in the education. Uh, basically, the way we see this COVID impact in the region is until we have a vaccine, COVID will continue to impact our countries. And we will have that uh, situation in which uh, we will have peaks and valleys and we'll have managing the, the health issue and the safety of the students in the public education system. So therefore we will see a weakening, a, a, a worst of public education given all of the circumstances that we have. We don't have the, digital, the, the proper digitalization and the proper technology to compensate that uh, as the region is impacted by COVID. Therefore, both in public education and in general, every activity that we have in the region due to COVID, to the COVID impact, until we have the vaccine, we will not be able to come out of this. If the question is more how do I see public education in general, it has significant weaknesses and there's a lot of improvement that needs to happen in order to really train and educate properly our people, our youth. But that's a, that's a different topic for a different conversation. Thank you, Enrique. I, I, I want to end uh, by thanking everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you to our speakers, President Chinchilla, Mayu, Don Enrique, Salvador, and Andy for joining us and for all that you have done and continue to do for Central America. Today's conversation showed how the region can use this historical moment to advance a transformative recovery and how that recovery will depend on tackling long-term structural challenges while finding new opportunities to take advantage of demographic trends, nearshoring of multinational firms, and regional integration. Before we end, I want to invite the audience to read the report that Mayu, President Chinchilla, Maria Fernanda, Don Enrique, Salvador, and myself authored. It was released this morning and is now available in the Atlantic Council website. At the Adrian Arsh Latin American Center, we will continue to provide new analysis for policymakers and decision makers in the region, the United States, and the international community on Central America's new trajectory with a focus on inclusive economic growth, foreign investment, rule of law, and anti-corruption efforts. And finally, I would like to thank Adrian for joining us today and Maria Fernanda for moderating today's discussion. With that, hope everyone has a good rest of the day and until next time.